بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المعصومين المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى أخيك قمر العشيرة أبا الفضل العباس بن أمير المؤمنين سادتي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة ومن يوق شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون Enlighten your hearts and gatherings with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran that there are the ones that are selfless towards themselves even though they are needy and they are poor. And the ones that are able to overcome the inner greediness are the ones that are victorious and successful. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this ayah. Now, the reason for the revelation of this ayah is mentioned in Tafsir al-Burhan. The Imam says that a man came to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He told the Holy Prophet, I'm poor, I'm hungry. It was at a time that the Muslims were going through a very hard time in Medina. So the Prophet sent word to his wives, to, the, to his house, what do we have to feed this man? He's asking for food. They said, all we have is water. We don't have anything else. So the Prophet asked the companions, who of you can take this man tonight and feed them? As usual, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam put his hand up and he took the man as his guest that night. So he went home to Fatima Zahra alayhi salam and he told her, what do we have for food tonight? She said, all we have is a few pieces of bread for the children. We don't have food, enough food for ourselves. He said, okay, well, I've got a guest now. So put the children to sleep early tonight, take the bread out, put it, put it in front of them, and turn off the lanterns, turn off the lights, and we'll get to why he did this. So he brought the poor man in, he sat down, the lights are off, he can't see what's in front of him. He, the man began eating, Imam Ali salam pretended to eat as well pretended to eat so that the man does not hold back so that the man can be comfortable eating as well all of a sudden the man stopped he said why did you stop he said i'm full alhamdulillah so the imam turned on the lanterns the food was still there all the food was there he said you didn't eat anything he said i did i ate and i'm full now it was a miracle from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the food was still there. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So the next day, Imam Ali alayhi salam went to the Holy Prophet. He, the Holy Prophet told him, this, this, and this happened yesterday. He said, yes. 
How did you know? Jibra'il came to me and he revealed this ayah. The people that are selfless towards themselves, towards their family, and they give even though they need it. This is the reason for this revelation. Now, for today's topic, we'll have a look at many components in life. If you have a look at any component in life, they usually have levels. If you look at morals of an individual, people are different levels in morals. If you look at the piety, different levels of piety. Even when it comes to sin, there are different levels of sin as well. And then some of these components, they are limited to how many levels there are. Other components, no, they're unlimited. They're as unlimited as an individual wishes. These components, you can break them up into two categories. You've got the moral, sorry, you've got the materialistic, and then the spiritual or the morale components. For the spiritual and the morale components, you have something like seeking knowledge or worshipping. If someone was to seek knowledge, it's limitless. We can start learning from the day that we can start comprehending, we can start learning, and we can keep learning until the day we die. There's no limit to this. But when it comes to materialistic stuff, like an example is how much a human can grow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, that you human will not grow to the extent that you will reach the mountains, nor you will reach the inner earth. That's, you're limited. We are limited. You look at a newborn. They grow and grow and grow, become an infant. And then they grow, they become an adult at one point. And then all of a sudden they become, begin shrinking. The opposite begins to happen. So there are some components that are limited. Other components, like selflessness, which is our topic for today. Selflessness is a component of life, also known as ethar, component of life that is limitless. It can be used in different matters in life and has very vast levels. Now throughout the speech, we'll have a look at two main points. The first point, which will be very quick, is the meaning of selflessness. And point number two will be the different types of selflessness. Different types of ithar. We'll begin with the last salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, when you look at the meaning of selflessness, you can think of it, it is not something that you can sort of, whatever you have extra, you give it to someone and be considered selfless. This is not the meaning of selflessness. This could be known as generosity, being generous, you know, I have extra cars, I have extra toys, extra money, I give it to someone. Yes, that's generous. But that's not selfless. Imam Ali alayhi salam says in the narration, The greatest level of generosity is selflessness. That's our topic today. So we can think of this as a higher level of generosity. Someone's generous, but at one stage, one level of this generosity is when a person reached selflessness. Now, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he speaks to his companion Aban. He tells him, Ya Aban, Ama ta'lam anna Allah azza wa jal qad dhakar al-mu'thiroon ala anfusim? Do you not know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the ones that are selfless towards themselves in the Quran? He said, Yes, I do, my master. He said, if you take something, whatever you have, and you half it, you give them half and you keep half. You with me here? Yeah? 
if you give them half, then this is not selflessness, what the Imam is saying. You have not performed a selfless act. The Imam says, إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ وَهُوَ سَوَى That now you are equal. إِنَّمَا تُؤْثِرُهُ إِذَا أَنْتَ أَعْطَيْتَهُ مِنَ النُّصْفِ الْآخَرِ What does the Imam say? He says that in order to perform the selfless act, a selfless act, in this situation you have to give them from your half. After you've given them a half already, you have to take from your half and give it to them. That's when selflessness comes in. So what we want to understand is that selflessness is when we need something most and we give it to someone else. And this could be tangible or non-tangible. And this is where this comes in. Point number two is the types of selflessness. We begin with the last salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, selflessness, as I said, can involve many things. The first thing, as what comes to our mind all every time, is money. How selfless am I when it comes to my money? Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, test the Shia with three components. He says, test them with the times of prayer. How much do they look after the times of prayer? This is our topic, but this is one. The second one, he says, test them with how they keep their secrets, how they keep our secrets, the Imam saying, our secrets from our enemies. And this is a whole topic that can be spoken about in many lectures. The secrets of the Imams, basically, their narrations. And then the Imam says, the third point, which is the point we're looking at today, وَإِلَىٰ أَمْوَالِهِمْ كَيْفَ مُوَاسَاتِهِمْ لِإِخْوَانِهِمْ فِيهَا And have a look at that Shia. Test them with this third test. When it comes to their money, how do they remorse? How do they comfort other people with their money? The Imam gives us three, these three criteria for any Shia. How does this person assist other people in their community without them asking me, without them asking if I am well off or even if I'm not well off. How do I help other people in my community with my money? How do I comfort them and remorse with them? This, is, this falls under the components of living with others. Now, this is not just regarding individuals. Being selfless with my money when it comes to donating to centers. These centers and mosques, they all run on the money of indi on individuals. They, they, money doesn't go on trees. They don't have the tree money planted in these centers. They run on the money of individuals. How selfless am I with my money, even if I need it? The Imam says, even if I give half of my money, it's not a selfless act yet. And I speak to myself before I speak to anyone else. This is when it comes to money. Another component is how selfless am I with other components, other tangible components. You know, a selfless person always will think outside the box. They will think outside the box as in, how can I help others? You know, with food, with clothing, with housing, whatever it is. You might say that, who's going to take food and clothing these days? But a selfless person always thinks outside the box. Example, why don't I make a feast whenever there's a martyrdom or a celebration for the Ahlul Bayt? Let's make a feast in my house and invite people over. We're not saying that that person needs to be fed, but why don't I spend on others in this way? Or when it comes to clothing, if I buy a toy, why don't I think about my friend that doesn't have this toy? Instead of coming and showing them and they want it as well, why don't I buy them one as well? Or if I buy clothes for my children, why don't I think about my friend that also has children and buy them clothes? Thinking outside the box when it comes to selflessness.
It has no limits, as I said. And now we come to the non-tangible, the non-materialistic components when it comes to selflessness. The first one is, you know, becoming a lead. How? Sometimes we can't help an individual. No, we're limited. We don't have the funding. We don't have the facilities to help someone. However, I have a reputation. I come to imagine this. I have a reputation in the community, and I can help them. How? By being a lead. Leading them to someone that can help. Or going to that person and telling them, asking them for money. Going to that person, asking them for whatever it is that is required. Someone might say that, I don't even do this for myself. Why would I do it for someone else? This is selflessness. Doing something that I don't do for myself and prioritizing others with it is when the selflessness comes into place. Is when it becomes a selfless act. At the same time, I shouldn't always be a person that send, sends people off to other people to help them. Which brings me to my second non-tangible selfless act. Sometimes we have to put in our time. Time, we all know, it is the most important thing we have. Even the narrations tell us. And we are limited with time. We have barely enough time to sleep, eat, work, and spend time with our friends or our family. So how much of this time do I sacrifice for others? Sometimes I shouldn't keep sending people off to others. I should spend more time with them. Maybe I can help them if I do. How much time do I sacrifice to take people, bring them to the Husseinia if they need it? Transport them to appointments if they need it. Sacrificing the time. Not extra time that I have. Sacrificing the important time that I have assigned to myself. Or how much time, again, not just towards other individuals. How much time do I spend assisting in these places? In these mosques, in these Husseiniyat. Just like these places run on the money of people, they also run on the shoulders of individuals. They don't run themselves. And there is always something we can volunteer with. How many times do I go up to someone that's in charge and ask them, how can I support you this year in your programs? How can I support in your Muharram programs? How can I support in uh, Shah Ramadan programs? There are always ways that we can use our expertise to assist. And I'm sure some of you already do this. So, this is being selfless with the time. This is what it means. Now, being selfless has its rewards. Has some very great rewards. There was once a man, a student that studied in Hausa in Iran. He got married. And soon after he got married, as he was studying at the same time, they went into extreme poverty and there was a cut in supplies. There was a shortage in food supplies in the country. So he said that whenever they wanted to get bread, something as simple as bread, they would have to wait in lines, extremely long lines. He would go from the morning as soon as they open or even before they open and he would still have to wait in line. And he would just make it to get bread and then go to his lessons. He said, I, would, I was doing this for a long time. And it was difficult. So one day he said, I got bread. I waited in line for a very long time, hours maybe. And then all of a sudden, I got my bread. I was walking away. And a lady stopped me. She said, I have kids. I need to go back to them. No one's looking after them. And I need this bread. He said, I thought to myself, if I give her this bread, then I can't stand in line again because... I have class. I have lessons today. He said, here you go. He gave it to her. He gave her the only thing, the only food source they had for that day. 
He went back home to his wife. She said, where's the bread? He said, I, I gave it away. She said, that's the only thing we had to eat today. He said, that's fine. We'll fast today if we have to. Selfless needs what they gave, yet they still give it. So what happened? And this is the reward here. What happened is, as he was about to leave to go to class, a man knocked on the door. He opened the door. It was the baker. The baker told him, I see you waiting in line every single day. And I understand you're a talib ilm, you're a scholar and you, you study. So he said, so that you don't waste your time, every morning a bag of bread will be delivered to your house. This man, mind you, this man doesn't know that this student gave the bread away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him. If I perform any selfless act with my time, with my money, with anything I have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate me. If I sacrifice some time from work or with sacrifice time that I usually spend with my friends, then Allah will make this up to me, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I have will be done for me without me realizing. This man just saved himself hours of waiting in line every single day and now he can spend it on studying and going to extra lessons, whatever it is. This is the reward. Another form of selflessness is when it comes to dua. And this is something that not many people think of usually. How selfless am I with my dua? Do I think of other people? On a daily basis, if we spend time around other mu'mineen, we get to ask people, perform dua for me. Don't forget me in your dua. Always get asked. How often do I remember this? Remember when the speech from the, a few days ago that I spoke about betrayal. One, if, if a mu'min asks us to do something for them and we do not do it, then we're betraying that person. We must remember. Now, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he says, يُسْتَجَابُ لِلْرَجُلْ مِنْ أَخِيهِ مَا لَا يُسْتَجَابُ لِنَفْسِهِ That if a person performs dua, sometimes that person's dua will be accepted for their brother or the sister in religion. But that same dua will not be accepted for themselves. What does Islam teach us? Islam teach us, teaches us that we should be close together, living together and remembering each other all the time. I remember my brother. My brother remembers me before anything. This is what it teaches us. Otherwise, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept my dua for my brother and not accept my dua for myself? It teaches us that we must remember others. Imam Hassan alayhi salam, he was once sitting down with his mother. His mother was praying salat al-lil. So he paid attention to her reciting dua and her supplications. And he realized one thing. He realized that his mother's performing supplications for other people, the neighbors and everyone else but not her and her family. So the Imam, after she finished, the Imam was young. He told her, you have performed dua for everyone except us. Fatima Zahra alayhi salam said, al jar thumma da The neighbor, then the house. Remember the neighbor, and then you remember yourself. With everything, not just dua. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Man da'a li akhihi bi dhahr al-ghayb, nadahu malak min as-sama wa laka mithlah. If a person was to perform dua for their brother or their sister, an angel calls them from the sky, he says that you get the same thing that you ask for your brother or your sister. How does this not encourage me? To remember others before remembering myself. If I want something, let me ask for the same thing for my brothers and sisters. This is how 
Islam teaches us selflessness and ethar. Now, how much time do we have? Okay. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Holy Quran a great act of selflessness. And this is selflessness when it comes to our souls, ourselves. The ayah says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ ابْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ رَعُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ Who did this ayah come down for? Imam Ali alayhi salam. The story, and I'll quickly go through this because I'm cautious of time. The Prophet was tried, they tried to assassinate the Prophet in many occasions. They tried to kill the Prophet. When the Prophet, on one day, one night, the Arabs at the time of the Jahiliyyah, they decided to gather people to kill the Prophet on a certain night. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the, the Prophet to leave Medina. When the Prophet was about to leave Medina, he asked Imam Ali alayhi salam, would you sleep in my bed? He said, is this, going, am I going to make sure, uh, is this going to make sure you're safe? He said, yes. He said, I'll sleep in your bed. And he slept in his bed that night while the Prophet left the city just to make sure his brother, Rasulullah, is safe. And this is why this ayah came down. Sacrificing himself for the Holy Prophet. Abel Fadl Abbas to Imam Hussein was just like Imam Ali to the Holy Prophet. You learn, we learn many lessons of selflessness from Abu Fadl al-Abbas. I can quickly mention three different situations. One of these situations was when Shimar Allah was, he was talking to Umar ibn Sa'd. He told him, Umar ibn Sa'd told him that our army is great. We can wipe them out. It will take us a few hours, maybe a few minutes. Wipe them out. Shimon said, what? who are you kidding? This army in front of us has a man that if, we, if the, he wanted, he can wipe us out. Who is this man? He's Abel Fadl al-Abbas. The son of Umm al-Banin. He'll wipe us out. He said, okay, go and convince him to swap over and come to us. Shimmer went, he said, Aina awlaad ukhtina. Where are the sons of our sister? Where is Al-Abbas and his brothers? Umm al-Banin, the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, was from the same tribe that Shimmer al-Anahullah came from. So Al-Abbas was at the tent, he put his head down. He's, he was embarrassed that this, this man was calling him. So Imam Hussein alayhi salam said, answer him even though he's a kafir. Go and see what he wants. He said, do you give me the chance to, give, to kill him? He said, no. I do not want to be the one that starts this war. He went, he said, what do you want, Ibn al-Jawshan? He didn't even call him from his name. Shimmer told him, I will guarantee you two things, just come to us. I will make sure you and your brothers are protected, just come. And I will make sure that you become the commander of the army. Just join us. Al-Abbas got angry. He said, You grant me protection and the grandson of Rasulullah does not have protection? May Allah curse you and your protection. Not for a moment he thought about himself. Situation number two was when he went to the water. Imam Baqir alayhi salam says that the heart of Al-Abbas was like the burning coal from the thirst. He picked up the water and he threw it. Why? Because his brother was thirsty. Situation number three. When Imam Hussain alayhi salam wanted to take him after Al-Abbas was struck, 
He wanted to take him to the tents. He told him, no, don't, don't take me. Why? We've taken the companions and the family members. Everyone's in the tents. They're buried there. Or not buried. They're sitting in the tents, lying down. He said, no, I do not want Zainab and Ruqayya and Sukaina to see me. My, I do not want to break Zainab's heart. Up to the last moment of his life, he was thinking about others. About Zainab, about his brother Hussein. Thinking about everyone except himself. Salamullah alayhi. When Al Abbas's brothers came forward one by one and sacrificed their life before their Imam, Al Abbas was left alone. He was the last man left in the army of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So he came forward and he asked his Imam for permission to go fight. Imam Hussein told him, Ya Akhi, Anta Sahibu Liwa'i. Oh brother, you are the flag bearer. Yes, you are the last person, but if you go, then my army will be destroyed. You are my army. Abbas was determined to confront the enemy. The Imam said, if you must, then go and ask for water. Go and bring some water for the children. Al-Abbas mounted his horse and he began running and charging towards the enemies. Cleaving the enemies, no one would stand in his way. He arrived at the river. He picked up the water in his hand and then he threw the water. He called Ya nafsu min ba'd al-Husayn huni Abbas, you're worthless after Hussein's fall Wa ba'dahu la kunti aw takuni Living or dying makes no difference at all هذا حسين وارد المنون حسين is dying from thirst his pain is extreme وتشربين بارد المعين so how could you drink from this cool water he filled the container that he took with him and he mounted his horse and headed towards the camp. The enemies were determined to stop him. They began coming in hordes and enemies surrounded him from all directions. They began hiding behind the trees. As Al Abbas was walking, was, was riding his horse through the, through the enemies. A man by the name of Sayyid ibn Raqqa was hiding behind one of the trees. As Al Abbas came through, came past him, he struck him with the sword on his right arm. His eye, his right arm fell off. He began calling, Wallahi in qata'tumu yameeni. By Allah, if my hand they dare to cut, inni uhami abadan an dini. I'll defend my faith, seizing it never. وعن إمام صادق اليقين I'll protect my Imam true in conviction on the right path نجل النبي الطاهر الأمين The grandson of the Prophet purity in the picture Abbas hold on to both the flag and the water in one hand. He only had one hand left. As he headed back to the camp, Habib ibn al-Tufayl, he hid behind another bush 
and he struck him on his left arm. His left arm was severed. He began crying out, Ya nafsu la takhshay min al kuffar. Oh soul, fear not the disbelievers might wa abshiri bi rahmatil jabbar and rejoice in God's mercy shining bright ma an nabi al-sayyid al-mukhtar with the noble prophet as our guiding light قد قطعوا ببغيهم يساري They have severed my left hand An act of spite فأصلهم يا رب حار النار O Lord consign them to the hell fire after Al Abbas lost both of his arms, he clenched onto the water carrier, the water container with his mouth, with his teeth. He began impeding through the enemies. The enemies began raining upon him with the arrows. So one of the arrows found its way into the container. The water began leaking out. Another arrow pierced his chest. And another arrow pierced his eyes. With the container now drained of its water, Al Abbas didn't know what to do. Deprived of his hands to struck with a sword, and his eyes were blacked out from the arrow. He began trying to remove the arrow with the horse. He began trying to remove the arrow in his eye using the horse. While he was doing this, a man from Bani Tamim, he headed towards him with an iron pole. He struck him on the head with the pole. Al Abbas fell down to the ground. He cried, Adrik me, ya akhi. Oh brother, come to me, brother Hussein. This was the only time he called him brother. Every other time he would call me master. He would call him master Hussein. When I die, ya Abu Abdullah, alayka min salam. Oh brother Hussein, peace be upon you. When the Imam heard his call, he cried out, Oh brother, oh Abbas. Then he rushed to him like a falcon, descending upon the enemies, causing the enemies to flee left and right. He, they began running. He told them, where do you run after you've killed my brother? How dare you do this and run away from me? When he reached his brother, he saw his hands were severed. He saw that the, the arrow was in his eye. He leaned over to his brother. He sat next to him. He said, he said brother, now my back is broken. Brother, now my enemy have rejoiced because I have lost you. They say when Hussein, when Hussein came to his brother, he sat down with him, he comforted him. Then he went back to the tent. The ladies saw him, Zainab saw him. They asked him, where is Abbas? Where is our uncle? Where is our brother? They said Imam Hussein did not say a word. He went to the tent of Al Abbas. He removed the pillar of the tent, letting it fall to the ground, symbolizing that Abbas has been killed. May Allah have mercy on the one that calls Wa Abbas. Wa Abbas. 
عندما سقط العباس إلى الأرض وأغمي عليه من أثر ذاك الحديد صاح أخي أدرك أخاك تعنى من الخيام للعال قوم حسين تصيح بصوت يا عضيد وقعت وين بعد ما شوف داربي يا ضوى العين يا خوي الكون كله بعيني يا ظلام عندما أتاه الحسين انتبه العباس أن شخصا يتقدم من فقال يا ذا إن كنت تريد قتلي فدافع مهلني حتى يأتي ابن والد الحسين أودعه ويودعني يقول لي يا عباس ما نحسين يما واختلط دمعي بفيض دمك سكنة تسل الولد باسمك تقل ساعة ويجيب الماي عمك يقول له ابو فاضل عندك وصية قل له اي عندي وصية شنو وصيتك يا ابو فاضل يقول له اخوي حسين سلم لي على الحزينة خوي حسين سلم لي على الحزينة وقلها وقع راعي العلم لا ترتجينا قلها قطعة ويسارة ويمينا وبينما الحسين يكلم العباس إذ انقطع صوت أبي الفاق صاح الحسين يا خوي انكسار ظهري ولك ترى وصريت مركز يا خوي الكل الهموم يا خوي استحداني بعد كل قوم يا خوي استحداني ولا واحد علي بعد ينغار رحم الله من نادى وعباسه